Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Joshua Shank is the first ever Chief Innovation Officer at the LA Metro, where he leads the Office of Extraordinary Innovation. Prior to joining LA Metro, he served as President and CEO of the NO Center for Transportation. He holds a PhD in Urban Planning from Columbia University, a Master of City Planning from MIT, and a BA in Urban Studies from Columbia University. Currently lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Lindsay, and his sons, Max and Jonah. All right, Dr. Shank, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited to have you on and chat. I think, uh, you know, it's been a while since we've chatted. I've seen you speak at a number of conferences and, uh, you know, it seems like you're quoted all over the place, but uh, I'm glad to have you on the podcast. Hey, thanks. Always happy to talk to you, Harry. Cool. So, uh, you know, to start, I kind of want to give you an easy icebreaker. So I'm curious to know, uh, you know, what's your favorite mode of transportation these days? <laughs> you want me to ask? My, you want to ask me who my favorite child is too? Uh, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, but I, for you most know, people, I, it's I'm easy. A, I guess maybe not for you. I mean, that's a, that's a toughie. I, I would say uh, whatever mode gets me there uh, without having to wait. That's the that's the, what makes me crazy about about mm. traffic and and sometimes about our buses is that they're just stuck and not going. And that, I, I want modes that move. Yeah. I think that might be a good uh, tagline for a future campaign, modes that move. What do you think? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everyone wants to be on something that's moving. No one wants to sit around, right? So, yeah, I uh, think we uh, all... I think we all have that in common for sure. And I will say, I don't know if you're in the right city for that, you know, living in Los Angeles, but I think what uh, we're going to talk about today is you're working on changing that. So that's what, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm, you know, I'm really excited to chat with you about. I'm someone who uh, grew up in LA and is now living in LA. So, you know, I think you have kind of one of the coolest job titles in the industry. I think it's chief innovation officer for the LA County uh, MTA. So, I mean, is it that cool of a job? Is that what your day job is? And, you know, what exactly do you do from day to day? Well, I mean, look, it's it's a job at the end of the day. It's probably not as exciting mm-hmm. as my people people might think. It's not glamorous mm-hmm. or anything, but okay. it is a great job because essentially what I'm getting paid to do is to think about how to solve the transportation problems that all of us are facing mm-hmm. every day in Los Angeles, but to do it in creative ways that we haven't necessarily tried before. That's what innovation is, it. right? It's trying new things. So we've, we've, over the last four and a half years since we've been in existence, we've come up with a number of new ideas um, that we think can make a difference in mobility in Los Angeles County, and we've been trying them out and moving forward on a bunch of them, and, and it's exciting to see them come to fruition. Yeah, definitely. So what do you think is the most pressing, I guess, challenge or issue facing LA right now when it comes to transportation? Well, I often like to say that the way that we're using our transportation network is our biggest problem because we have an incredible amount of infrastructure here. The amount of roadway Mm. space and rail space, so much out there. We just use it in a very inefficient manner, which is that everyone gets in their own personal vehicle that's rather large and tries to compete Mm -hmm. for the space on those roads. And so as a result, there's never enough space for all the demand for vehicles. Um, So if we're just able to allocate that space more efficiently, and use more of it to get people who are in large vehicles full of people and get more of it to to accommodate people who are walking or biking and a- anything except driving alone, um, yeah. we're going to have everyone better off, even the people who do continue to drive alone. Uh, the, the problem right now is that we've created a system that defaults to driving alone as the fastest mode 95% of the time, and what that does is it slows down every mode. Mm. You know, that's a that's a good point. I don't actually know that I've ever heard anyone put it that way. And, you know, as someone who lives in L.A., I can kind of agree with you big time because, I mean, I just took my son on the train the other day, the expo line to go from my house to downtown. I'm driving. I'm taking scooters. I've got a meeting coming up. I'm probably going to take an Uber. Right. So I'm trying all these different modes. And I think you're right. When they work, the the breadth and variety of different transportation modes is pretty amazing. But I think you hit the nail on the head. It's just the sort of I guess the way where you using them <laughs> isn't, you know, kind of, kind of screws things. That's what screws things up, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about other public goods, right? Other things that we mm-hmm. all depend on for our lives, like water, electricity, food. You don't see 
uh, constant shortages of those things in our society because there's a price for all those things. So if, if you could just have as much of them as you wanted at any given time, there would be shortages of electricity, water, and food too. But that's how we mm. treat roadway space. You can have mm. as much of it as you want. <laughs> you know, there's no limit. If you want to go and drive around all day long, I mean, as long as you pay for the gas, you can do it. And, and I think some people do problem. do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're well aware that they do. So uh, as long yeah. as we keep allocating this precious resource, that a limited mm-hmm. resource that way, we're going to have a serious mobility problem. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about ways we can start, I guess, addressing it or tackling it. I mean, I know specifically, I don't, I don't know if I would say that you're a fan of congestion pricing, but I know this is something that you're passionate about and that you've talked about. Uh, is that right? Well, I think that if we actually care about how, uh, reducing traffic, which people in LA seem to talk about as a, as a mm-hmm. big issue a lot, right? If we really want to yeah. reduce traffic, that's the only way that we can realistically do it, right? If you look at the history of transportation in urban areas, building more mass transit is great. It's really important, but it doesn't actually reduce mm-hmm. traffic congestion. And trying to um, do it by building more roads never works. It's like loosening your belt after a big meal. Like That's not a weight loss program, <laughs> right? And, and so none of these other things work. And so if you do care about reducing traffic, ultimately you have to look at uh, pricing as a mechanism to do that. Right now we're making an active policy choice, which is that we as a society have decided that we prefer to sit in traffic rather than pay for our roads. I would argue that I'm not particularly happy with that choice. Maybe other people mm-hmm. like it. Maybe people like sitting in traffic. I've never heard anyone say that. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure no one likes it. Yeah, but that's but as a, as a society, we've all chosen to sit in traffic. You don't have to mm-hmm. do it that way. So that what we're trying to do is see. Well, what if we tested a different way? What if we tested something that wasn't everyone sitting in traffic? Would people prefer that? And and I think that's really important to try out. Yeah. So I think that sounds like all the experts agree congestion pricing is sort of, you know, the, uh, you know, I guess like not the mathematical or scientific way, but that's like the real solution to addressing some of these transportation issues, you know, related to basically people being able to get in their car and drive whenever and wherever they want. I guess my question, though, is how feasible do you think it is? And kind of like, how do we get to that point where it's more of a reality? Because it seems like changing things overnight isn't going to happen. But what's the first step? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It is going to take time, and um, it's you know I like to say it's the one solution we haven't tried, so it's worth mm. a shot, right? Um, but the That's true. the reality is that that we recognize that this is not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen without substantial public outreach and finding out mm-hmm. what people think and how they think this could work for them. So that's how we're starting our traffic reduction study, is by going out with a, a, a huge outreach campaign to talk to communities about their transportation problems. And not going out and saying, mm-hmm. hey, here's our traffic congestion management program, what do you think? We're not doing that, we don't have a plan yet. We're going out to talk to people before we have a plan to say, what do you think we should do? What would your suggestions be for how to improve transportation in your community? If you were to look at pricing, what would it look like? And then we're going to develop the plan from there. And I think that strategy allows us to have a chance with this highly controversial issue. Do you ever wish that you could just wave a magic wand and everyone would be on the same page when it comes to congestion pricing? Or do you think that all of this outreach is important and kind of a necessary part of the process? I think it is a necessary part of the process because whenever you do outreach that's genuine, I'm not talking about outreach mm-hmm. where you just present people just with to a do plan it. and say, do you like it or not? We're checking the box. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about <laughs> genuine public outreach. You get good feedback. That's what genuine public mm-hmm. outreach is. You get people to, to tell you, well, look, congestion pricing could work here, but if you're going to do it, you need to provide me with this alternative in order for me to get to work every day. And then you know what it is you need to do in addition to the pricing that makes a package that people can live with. So I do think that it is, it, I, I wouldn't wave a magic wand because I need we all need to know what people want mm. before we can give it to them. That's our job as public officials. Yeah. So what is the status of, uh, I, I think you referenced a study that the city of LA is doing. What's the status? I guess, how close uh, are we to getting some type of congestion pricing? Well, first of all, the study is Metro study, not the city. So uh, we, we're leading okay. the, the traffic reduction study. Um, and the timeline at this moment is we're going to conduct outreach over the next several months. We're going to 
to try to develop some plans and find a pilot area based on that outreach. And then we're going to come back to the board early next year with some options of you know places mm-hmm. that we think might make some sense. And then from there, we'll look at, okay, if, if they, we've, we see some options that, want, that make sense and we can develop them further, we'll work with those communities to get something that we think is uh, implementable and hopefully uh, we start to get that uh, ready for, for implementation. But you know, all this takes time. It's in that we're just talking yeah. about a pilot area. At, you know, we're not talking about yeah. implementation across LA County. It's a pilot area, and if people like it, um, you know, the nice thing about congestion pricing is it's it's infrastructure light, right? It doesn't take a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of capital investment. So if people like it, uh, we can expand it. If people hate it, we'll take it out, and you know, it'll be a, good, a worthwhile experiment. But in general, as you probably know, where we've tried congestion pricing across the world. People have liked it, and it has stuck because it's provided you know, pretty substantial benefits. Yeah, no, definitely. I think. Uh, well, I guess I would say that I'm I'm ex- I'm most excited because we're talking pilots, right? We're not talking just studies, and you know, I think that's sometimes a joke, right? That we can study this and that um, for years on end. But I think if we're already talking pilots, that's definitely a positive sign. So I'm I'm excited to see where that heads. And obviously, one of the aspects of congestion pricing that I'm curious about is kind of how TNCs, um, you know, fit into that, yeah. uh, like Uber and Lyft. And I think that in other cities, you know, New York um, and other cities around the U.S. and world even, I mean, I think that I'm curious to get your take because I feel like they're kind of an easy target of attack right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they don't have the same political will and capital that they had a few years ago. Yes. And so if you were going to, let's say, pilot congestion pricing, Uber and Lyft are kind of a, a good place to start. It seems like that's how some cities um, or transportation authorities are approaching it. What are your thoughts there? Well, I'd be a little bit cautious about that kind of approach because if you look at the numbers in terms of contributing to traffic congestion, TNCs are still a pretty low number, right? I mean, I've seen like two mm-hmm. to three uh, percent. The, the yeah, traffic I think it's single digits, yeah. you know, of the overall traffic, exactly. right? In most cities, the, the issue is much more systemic than that. So, if we were to just do a pilot mm-hmm. that focused on TNCs, we wouldn't accomplish the mobility benefit that we're looking for. And then people wouldn't be convinced of the worth of congestion pricing. The whole point of this pilot is to demonstrate the value of the method. So we'd want to do something yeah. more extensive than that. And, you know, I, I think there is a, the case to be made on TNCs from a public policy perspective. And the one that we've been making is not that they should be taxed uh, any different than any other uh, you know person driving on the road, but that they should be regulated such that they are safe and that they are providing services equitably to everyone. Because the issue that we, as yeah. you know, the issue we've had with TNCs is that they're not accommodating all segments of society effectively, that they do in effect, yeah. discriminate. And that's an issue from a public policy perspective that we would like to address. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think actually one thing you said that really stood out to me is that one of the you know points of piloting these congestion pricing pilots is to sort of get feedback and sort of see what the public reaction is. I could kind of even imagine, right, for some of the cities that are, you know, doing congestion pricing only pilots with Uber and Lyft, it doesn't, you know, they try it, rides are now going to be more expensive for riders because the passes cost directly on to riders. And then, um, but it doesn't really change anything or it doesn't really help and sort of might actually harm the, uh, you know, kind of uh, credibility of congestion pricing in that way too, if you implement it in a way that doesn't actually do anything. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, if, you, if you're going to spend the political capital to try to get it done, get it done in a way that people will really notice the difference and love it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, and that's interesting, too. I, I appreciate your comments on, uh, you know, kind of what what the goals are in regulating TNCs when it comes to safety and uh, equitable access. What, what are your thoughts about micro mobility and how that, that all fits into the picture there? Is it same similar goals as TNC? Yeah, I think it is similar. I think the difference is that micromobility has the potential to much more positively interact with our overarching goal, right? Because I consider a TNC mm-hmm. ride to be a single occupancy vehicle trip, right? It's effectively a single. You, know, you might have a driver, yeah, but I agree. Yeah, it's it's still single occupancy vehicle, and and from a mobility standpoint, that's more problematic. Whereas the scooters and bikes, 
those represent non-single occupancy vehicle trips. So we're looking to increase those and provide safe spaces for those as much as we can. So that's the distinction I would make. But nonetheless, your point is still the same, which is these are private mobility providers. And we mm-hmm. want to make sure that they are providing equitable access, that they're providing something, a service that is you know, accessible to all people in society, and that it is uh, working with and not against the transit network. You know, the, the, the goal should be to feed the transit network and to, you know, to be complementary to transit, not to substitute for transit trips. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons I'm pretty, um, I guess, bullish on micromobility is, you know, I've sort of fir- had firsthand experience with picking up and dropping off, you know, on Uber and Lyft first and last mile type trips, right? Dropping yep. someone off at a transit station or picking them up. And it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. You know, it usually happens, you know, you're trying to pick someone up in rush hour right. and there's nowhere to pull over to park and it's a kind of an expensive trip and they just got off a 275, you know, Metro trip or whatever it might be. And then when you bring in, you know, a scooter, I've also picked up scooters, you know, as a bird charger and, you know, actually picked up these scooters from uh, metro stations and dropped them off at 5 a.m., you know, before, which I don't actually recommend. It's not very fun. But, uh, you know, I've sort of seen the actual real world potential. And so I'm curious to ask you, how, how do you think L.A. is doing in regards to kind of embracing the best aspects of uh, mobility and even TNCs, too? Because I think there's definitely some positives to TNCs, too, as even though not everyone might agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly agree that there are lots of positives from a mobility standpoint and even from an equity standpoint of TNCs. You know, they, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're allowing people to, first of all, not drive drunk, which seems to be a, you know, lost yeah. in the shuffle, but that's a really important component of what they do um, in terms of contributing to safety. Um, and they are also enabling people to not necessarily think about whether they have to have their car ready for them and they can use other modes to get around and then rely on a TNC if necessary, because it's a great backup plan that's always there, right? So I, I, yeah. I think that we shouldn't forget about those mobility benefits. The point of working with TNCs from Metro's perspective is to combine the best of what they've provided with the, with the best of what the mm-hmm. public sector offers. So to, not to lose what they are providing in terms of benefits, but to try to curb some of the negative externalities that they're creating while adding more benefits to what they're, what they're demonstrating. So I think that's what we've been trying to do with our mobility on demand uh, partnership uh, yeah. at those three stations that, that we we're partnering with VIA. And I think it's working really well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I know we've chatted about the mobility on demand partnership in the past and it's definitely something I've been keeping an eye on. I think actually I had a friend, uh, send me a picture of a sedan with a, a via logo. I think it was a, a magnet on the side and that was the first one I'd actually seen. So can you give a quick update on, or maybe just a quick description yeah. of what that partnership is and kind of how it takes the best of TNC and best of Metro and I guess how it's going too now that it's been up and running for a while, if you have a little Inside on that. Yeah, sure thing. Well, the, the idea behind the pilot is that there are many people for whom using a TNC, traditional TNC, to get to our stations um, is either impossible or, or very challenging, right? Because either they don't have a smartphone or they are disabled mm-hmm. um, or they can't afford it. Um, and so we yeah. decided that with, with a grant from FTA that we would create um, a service for those customers and uh, that it would be only ride-share service, so no, no single occupancy vehicle mm-hmm. rides. You have to share rides. Um, and w- the partnership is at three stations. It's uh, El Monte, North Hollywood, and Artesia. And w- what it does is it, it draws a zone around those stations, and if you're within that zone, you can use the VIA service to get to and from those stations and the Metrolink stations within the area. So you can't just use it to go wherever you want within that zone. You have to be going to or from one of the metro stations. Got it. So it's a first last mile service option for the most disadvantaged uh, of our customers. And um, since it launched, it was over a year, um, and the board just approved a second year of it, uh, we have vastly hmm. exceeded our um, key performance indicators for this project. It's been more popular than we anticipated. Um, and we've gotten uh, to the point where uh, we've got, well, you know, we, we had 3,000 rides a week as our goal. We're well past that. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing major increases now in, in the Compton area because of the fact that the A-line is reopened and, and more and more people are using that service. Um, it's just becoming more and more popular because 
there are lots of people who used to drive and park to these stations, and now they don't have to, and it's a lot less of a mm-hmm. hassle for them. There are lots of people who used to take a bus, and, and it would take them a lot longer, or they used to walk, and it would take them a lot longer, and now they have a much faster travel time. So we've, we've really improved things, we think, for our customers, and we're looking to, to keep that, that service going. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I mean, I know this, uh, partnership got going before sort of the invasion of the scooters and bikes, but do you see, I mean, I guess this sort of like actual ride share, you know, with the, the po- multiple pooled rides that Via is doing, do you see that as kind of a better product, um, than maybe, you know, scooters or bikes? Cause I sort of, I'm curious to get your take on like what you think, um, is the best sort of first mile, last mile connector in these types of situations. Is it this kind of shared rides aspect or might it be an e-bike or a bunch of scooters? Yeah, it's funny you ask that because what we're thinking about now is why do we, why do we have to choose? Um, you know, it's true that Via doesn't Mm. offer scooters or bikes, but they could partner with someone who does. And we're putting together a competitive procurement to potentially extend this at the end of it that will be modally Mm. agnostic and say who wants to come in and provide the best Mm. possible first class mile services to these stations Um, we don't care if it's shared rides or scooters and bikes or anything else that isn't a single occupancy vehicle Um, we just want to get people to and from the stations and so i think that's how we'll approach it as we go forward Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's actually a really smart way to go about it. I know that I've always been pretty skeptical of using Uber or Lyft or other TNCs for first last mile connections. But at the end of the day, too, you know, there are probably times and places and situations where they are a better connector. You know, I'm sort of thinking about like commuter rails up in the Bay Area, right, where you're kind of you're doing a first and last mile to a nice long trip on the BART. Uh, That rideshare might make a little more sense versus, you know, like going straight into downtown. But I think at the end of the day, like you said, who cares what that mode is, um, as long as it's sort of, you know, I guess achieving the ultimate goals. Exactly, right? and if it's worth the, the cost, right? It has to be affordable, and it has to be yeah. uh, achieving that goal. And and I agree with you. TNCs are not great for first class mile for most of our stations. I mean, we chose those stations for a reason. Mm-hmm. One is that they are serving disadvantaged communities, but another is that the access to them by public transit is rather weak. And that's why we need mm-hmm. – if there are great buses feeding into the stations, we don't need to put the TNCs there. Buses are a much more effective way of getting people to and from our stations. But in these cases, um, there was a lack of effective access, and this is a more cost-effective way to cover it. Yeah. Well, so I think speaking of public private partnerships, uh, what are your thoughts as far as like how Uber is now working with transit? I think that, you know, I I could say you could say that they're sort of trying to reverse their image. But I think at the end of the day, too, you know, I mean, I think I pulled up the app the other day on it was either Uber or Lyft or both and, you know, saw um, transit directions instead of taking Mm -hmm. an Uber. Right. And so I think that they're actually adding some features. I'm curious to get your take. How uh, meaningful do you think some of these features and partnerships and integrations with transit that, you know, the big companies, Uber and Lyft, are adding? Well, I'm somewhat confused about how this helps them become profitable. That That's the part I don't understand, and I, I, maybe <laughs> someone will explain it to me from, from these companies. But I'll tell you where I do see the intersection that's been positive. Um, for example, we've, we've done a partnership mm-hmm. with Lyft recently where they've purchased a number of our tap cards and given them to their customers mm-hmm. in order to encourage people to give up their cars, right? And that's where I think the intersection is. Uber and Lyft don't want people to own cars. We don't want people to own cars. So we can work together on ways to reduce car ownership and leave the driving to the professionals. I think that makes a lot of sense uh, from a safety and mobility and an equity standpoint. So we are very interested in those types of partnerships, and I I, I think it works for Mm -hmm. us. I don't pretend to know why it works for their financial bottom line, though. Yeah, well, I think you actually may have just answered your own question because I think it's sort of uh, a typical, maybe not a typical, but I think in one way it's kind of an innovative strategy of disrupting yourself in the short term, sort of how Uber and Lyft did with scooters, right? Scooters and bikes take away from a lot of the zero to one and zero to two mile trips where actually the companies take, you know, close to 40 to 50% of the rides or actually sort of make the most money on a percentage basis on those short rides. And they're sort of giving that up for those uh, scooter and bike rides. But I think what it does do it does kind of open up you know a partnership with transit and um, i think it's kind of one of the 
three key, three or four key legs of the stool to getting rid of your car. Mm -hmm. So you said that Uber and Lyft and, you know, Metro and, you know, I guess public transit in general do have in common. What they really have in common is the fact that they want to get people out of cars because I think what that does is it might, um, you know, I think in a lot of cases, maybe Uber and Lyft are thinking that it would actually get people to, you know, go from taking one or two Uber and Lyft rides a week to, you know, five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10. Um, I mean, what, what do you think are the two or three key modes that might enable people to getting out of their cars? I mean, obviously public transit, do you think TNC is up there? I think TNCs do play a role. Um, but I, I, if you look at the, the place where we have real opportunity to improve our market share um, and, and get people out of cars, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's not necessarily with the, uh, the folks who are higher earners, right? I mean, you kind of have to write off a lot mm-hmm. of people who who make money. I mean, it's unfortunate, but you do because they, they're well. Why they is tend that? To, they tend to have oh, a vehicle ownership is going to be a given. It's not a big burden on them, and okay. they tend to live in places that are going to be less accessible by public transit. Um, gotcha. And meanwhile, there are lots of people that we see who are perhaps middle income or or working class people who are struggling to keep a car. Mm-hmm and pay for it because uh, they don't feel like they have an alternative. So that's the, the target audience for us is how can we relieve the financial burden on a lot of people by providing alternatives that are more feasible? And I think TNCs are, are, can be a part of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's great. So, um, you know, kind of wrapping up here, I did want to ask if there are any other projects or partnerships that either your office is working on directly or anything else that you're really excited about. I think you, I think I saw you tweet something out about, uh, the other day about a proposal that would let transit riders skip lines at LAX, which that kind of like stuff like that, I think is really cool. It kind of actually reminded me of, you know, I mean, there's so much innovation happening around the world. I remember when I went to Hong Kong, um, you could actually check in your bags at the first you know, where you got on to the Metro, I forgot what, the, whatever their rail is called and they would send your bags along for you. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So is there, are there any cool, uh, projects or partnerships that you've got in the works or anything you're just really excited about, uh, in regards to LA? Yeah. Going forward? Yeah. So just like you said, um, incentives, uh, are a really important thing. And that's what you're referring mm-hmm. to on that LAX piece. Right. And we're working on something we're calling yep. a travel rewards program where we would potentially partner mm. with uh, a platform like a TNC to encourage people to mm. do things besides drive alone. And and the way that that would work is mm. we work with employers around the region. And if an employer wants to participate in the program, they can help create incentives for their employees to use a package of mobility options other than driving and parking. And and what what that uh, yeah. accomplishes is, so let's say there's people who are right now driving and parking because it's their default, and they haven't really tried many of the other things. If you pr- present them with a package, it's not just, oh, take public transit. It's, yeah, you can take transit, you can use Uber and Lyft, you can use a bike and scooter, you can work from home one day. Like, here are all the things you can do to make this work. I think you have a much better shot of helping hmm. them give up the idea of maintaining a vehicle and driving it to work every day. So we're going to be coming out with an RFP probably later this year that brings someone on board to help us with that travel rewards program. Yeah. And I think one thing that sort of stands out to me in a lot of these type of incentive uh, programs and sort of something that I steal from the private side is that like kind of understanding what are people's pain points? Because when you address a pain point with an incentive, you sort of are able to encourage a mode shift or you're able to encourage someone to download an app, right? So for example, like when I saw that LAX uh, part, you know, I guess it was a proposal or whatever it was, um, people hate, you know, waiting in lines and going through security. So the ability mm-hmm. to skip security, even if that only saves them two minutes, the mental, you know, sort of, sort of psychological benefit of that, you'll go download an app, you'll go, you know, sign up for some program, you'll go do whatever, you'll do whatever the hell it takes, right? And so I think it kind of like, you know, connecting it to those pain points, I think is key versus just saying, oh, you know, you'll get 10% off at some restaurant that you've never eaten. For yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It has to provide a real benefit where people are currently experiencing something they don't like. And, uh, and that's that's exactly what we're after. And it, it's not enough just to go out and say to people, "Hey, uh, what, how about you make a little bit of a sacrifice, and we'll give you a little bit of a reward." It has to be much more, uh, much mm-hmm. much better and bigger than that. And that's what we're aiming to do. 
Yeah, definitely. So um, if people want to follow, uh, you know, more of your work and, you know, I, I did have one quick question. You, you mentioned that you're putting out RFPs. I know that these are typically more open to the bigger companies, but I mean, what is that process sort of if people are want to follow along with the RFPs that you guys are releasing or see what projects you're working on? What's, what's the best yeah, place to do that? you can go to our that? website. The, there's, there's always information about upcoming RFPs. And I would emphasize they're not just for big companies. I mean, we have a lot of small business um, mm. set asides and, and DBEs okay. and all that. We're trying to make sure that this is not just for big companies. So I'd encourage everyone to go there and check out what we've got coming up. The procurement maintains a list of upcoming uh, RFPs on our website. Cool. Yeah. And I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. And I think you're also a good follow on Twitter. So if people want to stay, stay up to date, I know they can follow you on Twitter Thanks. there. Uh, so Dr. Shank, appreciate you coming on and uh, look forward to seeing the future of uh, mobility in LA and all these uh, great improvements. All right. Thanks so much, Harry. 